Good evening, everybody. My name is Kaushik. I'm the co-founder and COO of Sugar Cosmetics. I'm hoping by now at least the women in the audience have tried out our products. Uh, please, let's have a show of hands. Oh, yes, thank you so much. You know, I, I, this is lovely because now when I ask at least, there are a few hands that go up. Otherwise, I remember those days very uh, vividly when I would be like, should I pull off this stunt with this audience or no? Okay, you know, Google ka I'm feeling lucky button and I would be like, let me try it. And there have been many audiences where I'd be looking for one hand to come up and know. But nevertheless, uh, thank you very much for, I know this is the last keynote session that's slotted. It's a very interesting topic, uh, one that's close to my heart and I'll tell you why. Because everybody asks us that makeup, color cosmetics, beauties is such a competitive category with uh, behemoths from the largest FMCG company whom we've looked up to over the years uh, playing in the space. So how did you guys actually manage to find your spot in, the, in here. And you know, there are two sides to the story. One, I could say, of course, we did amazing work, we did A, B, C, D, but all of that would have amounted to naught unless there was a consumer whose needs were unmet. That is because our consumer had actually evolved over the last decade. And today I'm gonna to touch upon a few topics which uh, highlight what had changed, what had evolved, which we were fortunate to spot, and how did we cash in on it. So without, uh, spending much time on uh, the preamble, I want to just start off by saying the biggest shift we have seen is that the way brands actually evolve, the, the way brands engage, reach out to consumers and vice versa, engage, the way consumers engage with brands have seen a drastic shift over the last decade. Everybody knows that because today we are all living fairly digital lives. We are connected. I mean, even now, right now, those of you who are checking your WhatsApps, don't worry, I do the same, it's fine. It is because there is somebody who's communicating with us right now, and uh, you know we want to we want to see what it's at. How has that changed, and what does this do to our attention span? I think for brands, there was a time when the mandate was fairly simple. You have a budget, you have your set channels of television, print, billboards, wherein you have to communicate the same channel, same same messaging across, and you put all your eggs in one basket and you pick a campaign for the year and you go all in on it. Of course, the, it worked, what, it, and that's not past tense, it still works. The only thing is, it's a very unidimensional way for a brand to communicate what it stands for, what it wants to champion, what it wants to talk about, what it wants to be known for to its audience. Then came a period when brands realized that, okay, people are getting to know about me, not just from my distribution, not just from television, not just from print, but from what, what, what are these? Oh, these are blogs. Okay, people are giving their own opinion on my products, on my services, and that's when it became important to start understanding that the reputation of a brand, the impression of a brand, is not tightly controlled by the brand itself any longer. There are people in the middle who are also putting their own flavor of it. Now, which was great for a while, but the thing about blogs is that blogs had very limited audience. When social media platforms explored, ex exploded, that's when you realize that, that you know, nobody had the time to go through and read, uh, spend 10 minutes in reading a blog, which is why the term blogger got replaced by influencers fairly quickly. And that's when brands realized that, okay, now it's not enough what I communicate on ATL and primetime television. It's also about what everyday micro conversations are happening on these different social media platforms. How do I even try controlling that or how do you even try navigating that? I mean, you can try, but you can never get it perfect because ultimately, the experience we provide, the product saliency, they have, they speak for itself. And of course, right now, the number of, the sheer number of influencers, micro influencers, it's easier to be a person, to be somebody who has an opinion on a product or services. What does this do to a brand? This pushes a brand to evolve. So there are two, this, 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 this basically poses a question in front of a brand that, okay, your target consumer is changing, the way they want to engage with you is changing. Do you think it's important to cater to them? Now, for a lot of brands, especially in our category, I realized that this was seen as a niche. That, okay, I, I remember there was a time when we used to speak to our partners, like, say, Mintra, Nike, Amazon, and they'd, they'd always, especially horizontal platforms, and the conversation would be, it's so difficult to get a top nav, you know, top navigation uh, category button drop down for beauty as a category, because it was not big enough. But that's the beauty about India. Today, what is niche? becomes very big tomorrow. And today, everybody wants to make content. Everybody wants to make a beauty and personal care play. But 
the magic of India lies in the fact that if you can identify a niche and go deep into it, build a reputation in it, I think that's when you can own the category when it becomes mainstream, which is, which is about accurate. This is what happened to us. So, I, 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 you know, when I say then and now, I don't mean, I, I literally mean then and now. It's not that the now has replaced the then, but the way the whole funnel has worked for brands over the years, how do you get the attention of a consumer? Earlier it used to be very limited channels, now there are channels multiplexing each other. There's social media, there's, 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 how do you generate interest? Earlier it used to be very, very clear, okay, you know, like, like FAL, like legendary brands, of, you know, of the large FMCG companies, they were very clear and direct and say, this is my product USP, buy it. Or this is my, this is uh, how attractive the price is, buy it. But now the audience wants more. Why do they want more? Because there is no, there is no only Kingfisher in the market anymore. There's Kingfisher, there's Bira, there's so many else. So why, you know, whether they ask you directly on your face or not, brands do ask, why you? Why should I purchase you when I have the choice of so many new brands? So this is when a lot of brands like ours who are able to cater to the audience that is asking questions. Because, see, let's get it straight. A lot of people don't ask questions. They are the mass. They are the mass. But for those who are experimenters, who are willing to let new brands get a foot in the door, these are the consumers who have evolved. They are also the taste makers. So if we identify these consumers and say, okay, um, let me create something which this consumer is asking for, and I'll, I'll show a slide where we talk about a specific example. That, at least in our category, we have seen goes a long way because they then spread the word about, okay, you know what? This is something that this new brand is doing differently. And that helps brands, especially new brands like ours, put, your foot, put our foot in the door observing and acknowledging the fact that consumers have evolved. I want to move on to, I'll come, I'll circle back to this slide later because for me when I talk about brand evolving, brand breaks down into two, three pillars. How have your products evolved? How has the content around your brand and products evolved? And thirdly, how has your buying experience evolved? But if I were to just talk about product evolution for a change, it's very easy to understand simple example. Historically, makeup usage peaked mostly after 30, 28, 30 age. And, and usually what happens is, as you grow older, your skin loses hydration. So when your skin loses hydration, you're not able to pull off very, very deep matte formulations, which is why you'd find that most of the um, lipstick formulations that were very popular, especially about a decade back, they were creamy mattes. Now the thing about creamy mattes is they're very comfortable to wear, but there's feathering, there's transferring, and you need to keep applying it. Now, the audience which we were talking to seem to have evolved from there and mostly because they started using makeup at a far younger age and when your skin is that hydrated you can pull off and be comfortable with a far matter formula deep matte formula what does the deep matte formula do it lasts longer without feathering without transferring and when you know i i don't quote this story often but back in 2015 we actually went with this observation to some of the large beauty players, um, two of them we went to at least, and we said, uh, you know, this is the observation which we are seeing from our other business. Also in this space, it was a beauty subscription service space. There seems to be a demand for deep matte products, which are drying, but very long lasting. And the answer we got from the larger companies was that, you know, we can't do this. We can't do this because our core audience it will antagonize our core audience because our core audience is the average age purchasing age is say 32 and this is too drying for them. To be fair, they were completely correct because yes, it would antagonize the existing audience but we had very strong data to back that, you know, for the younger audience, this would fly. Which is why one of the earliest products we launched was this liquid lipstick product that used and I, you know, even now if, you know, if somebody asks me that which is that one product which helped you enter a hundred thousand doors uh, 100,000 families to actually get the brand its escape velocity to start with, it would be this product. Similar, similarly, there were other, you know, if I can take many stories of course, but in the interest of time, uh, eyeliners, for example. Historically, we've always had very uh, glossy, shiny eyeliners. Why? Because makeup has always been seen as an occasion-based wear. But our customers have evolved because when makeup shifts from being an occasion-based wear to a regular wear, and I don't need to, uh, to read an article to say that. It's, it's, it's an office. I mean, there was a time when uh, you'd hear, overhear conversations that somebody's come in maybe, maybe uh, not wearing a kajal or a coal, which is perfectly okay. And friends are asking, hey, are you feeling unwell today? 
or it's, it's become as ubiquitous as toothpaste now. So when we see that, we realize that one can't wear glossy eyeliners to work every day. Makeup has to be more matte, more subtle. But the market didn't have that because that was not what used to push the numbers and that was not what you'd find selling in the larger uh, channels like, like modern trade or general trade. So understanding the fact that the need of consumers have changed. Um, one of, and when I say need, I also harp upon unstated needs. I, I, this, is, this is a review from 2017. Uh, it's a very telling review uh, and we have this blown up at our office uh, just as a reminder. Now somebody left a review about the liquid lipstick, the same one I spoke about. And it's amazing. They ask for so many things while not literally stating out any one particular thing. They don't want, our audience doesn't have time for touch-ups. They want world-class quality. They want at an affordable price. They don't want a single swipe application, no, no, no two applications. Uh, it should dry rapidly. Now, now, you know, there are so many deconstructed needs in this one review that when we look at it, the literal mandate to our product team is that, look at this, look at this. This is how demanding the audience is today. So if you're able to, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, if you're able to solve for at least half of these, the product is going to be a hit product. So when we, you know, we don't need to guess this right now because historically there's a way in which formulations have been made, gross margins of products have been protected. But the way brands are evolving right now, I think there's enough and more material out there, whether it be uh, reviews of, of course, platforms like Nike, Amazon, everywhere, or you know, focus group discussions, which are, which of course take longer, which give us cues as to how brands can be built. Uh, similar tangent on content. Earlier, content used to be about simply focusing on, okay, this is the product that's available, new and improved formulation available at your retail store and the price. But the audience is asking why. And when your audience asks why you, it has to be more than just a hardcore product push. So which is why we, are cognizant of the fact that there are multiple platforms that have evolved over a period of time. Uh, for example, YouTube is great for longer format contact, content, which is say maybe five to six minutes, wherein you take your time and patiently educate your audience about what your product or brand does. But, but it's not, it is one of the most vibrant platform, but not the most vibrant platforms for us, especially it's Instagram. What do you do in Instagram where the attention span is almost like that of a goldfish? You learn to condense your content. You learn to mix it up with entertainment, not just education, and keep talking about things which hit a chord with your audience. And this is something I think, uh, I mean, we've made a lot of mistakes over the years, but this is something I think we've genuinely done well. Uh, we've spoken consistently about multiple different pillars that the brand communication has been built on, whether it be inclusivity, about how there are 22 different shades in our foundation range from light to deep. Uh, about how individuality, metal, being bold and free. Now, these are not flash in the pan campaign. They've been like pushed out, communicated. We've had two-way communications with our audience on this. And when we, when we leverage social media to do that, that helps us rack up an enormous number of views. I mean, this, we, we currently get about 410 million impressions through our own channels on social media. And this is not even, if you look at the whole you know, paid earned, uh, owned model. This is not even, this doesn't even capture the earned media, which happens when others talk about our products. And this, this is, the end result of this is this. When you talk about how brands evolve, from October 19 to this is a little dated, uh, till February 21, we kept uh, tracking our followers on Instagram. And you know, this is how the black line is, is uh, the Sugar Cosmetics in Instagram account. So we are seeing a similar trajectory now in YouTube as well, but this is something which new age brands have uh, learned to do well, uh, carry on the conversation to platform where the brand is more natively, uh, uh, tr natively trust the brand, natively more engaged. And uh, the last part about commerce, I know there's a question every brand faces that should I, which platforms should I, should I sell on? And for larger brands, the question is, should I sell on an online platform? Should I sell on an app? There's this new uh, metaverse store, should I sell over there? And for brands like us, smaller brands, younger brands, the question is, when can we break through to the you know, big boy tables of general trade, modern trade? I think today's, there's no either or. I mean, when we look at all the, all the channels that are there, it's a matter of us, it's not a matter of where to sell. Because 
ultimately the customer will always purchase from where she is used to purchase from because she trusts the platform. So for brands, if you're trying to maintain trust and saliency across channels, it's a tough to ask to convince a consumer to A, buy your product, B, at the price that you're selling, C, through the channel which you want them to purchase in. It's too much to ask for, which is why as a brand, we've shifted our stance from that. We said they're all important to us, DTC is important, but being a DTC brand is not important. Being a large, loved brand is important, which is why I think some of our earlier notions, Sugar used to be called a DTC brand, we still get called a DTC brand, but not many people know that 55% of our revenues are actually from retail and not from DTC. So uh, hopefully it'll start showing up in some of the reports. So I'd like to end with this because there's this large red zero I see flashing over here right now. But uh, Sugar as a brand has evolved over a period of time through the evolutions we've seen in our product, in our content, in our commerce. And um, I think evolution is given. Evolution will happen whether we like it or not because our customers are evolving. And the minute, as long as we remember that the brands exist to serve the consumer, we'll have no option but to evolve with them. So thank you very much. Happy to take any questions if there are. But thanks for being a patient audience.